sorry that I can't handle things unfinished. I'm sorry that I wanted to love you with a witness. Not to say our garden wasn't enough of it was. Now I have to cross myself and remember where I came from. One part out west at the foot of a mountain. One part in a Dublin tenement building One part at the mouth of the River Shannon One part forgotten and it's loose in me came down living, I sat looking at a painting of a woman. It was done in human color and the cheeks were all in red. But I'd recognize that ribcage and that masochism anyway. Took you from a dream I had and put you in my life. One part out west at the foot of a mountain, one part in a Dublin tenement building, one part at the mouth of the river Shannon. One part forgotten and it's ruling me It's ruling me Thanks. Good morning. Um, wow, it's, it's great to be here in front of so many bright faces. Um, thank you again, uh, Aidan, for having me. And thanks to everyone who makes this event happen, especially all of you guys, uh, for being here. Um, so yeah, my name is Ray Moore. Um, I am an architect. Uh, I'm a design fellow in architecture in UCD. Um, I am a self-proclaimed artist, a uh, part-time activist, and I dabble in a few other things. And the image here on screen is a, a video still from an event, um, a wedding actually that I coordinated, was the kind of event manager for uh, about two years ago. And I think what this image just captures is the essence of what I do. And um, although architecture is, you know, it's a very material thing, um, the act of building, but ultimately the goal of what I do is really to, to create places for, it, for life to happen. Um, and so even things like working on little events um, just allows this kind of exploration of things like atmosphere and community and, and how people come together um, and how life unfolds in all these different places that we inhabit. So uh, as an architect and designer, I love a good brief and I was kind of thinking and riffing on this idea of preserve quite a bit. And the more I thought about it, the more kind of interesting I found it because like, there's so little in life that's static, right? Everything's always changing or it's in growth or flux, um, you know, it's decay or repair. And so actually often when we think, when I was thinking about the idea of preserving, that actually we're often creating something new, we're transforming something um, or even innovating. Um, and I thought, well, these are quite good examples. So like cheese was invented as a way to preserve milk or you know, cured meat or fermented vegetables that actually 
nothing is, is really static unless you're in perhaps a, you know, a kind of museum environment, that this idea of preservation is actually a kind of constant renewal uh, and reframing and relooking at things. Um, so I'm going to talk about some of my more personal projects. Um, and to kind of get into that, I thought I'd give you a bit of a background about, you know, kind of where I came from uh, and kind of who I am and what some of my values are. Um, so my parents are photographers, um, and I think from a very early age, things like subject, um, light, uh, and composition, all vital in architecture and design, but these values and these kind of ideas that were very much part of, you know, my family life as well. And I guess you can see here, I've always been like probably a bit of a slightly moody tomboy. That's me, age seven. <laughs> Yeah, I love this is me. Yeah, this was heading off to Electric Picnic last year. Um, <laughs> but yeah, I think as well as a designer, right, like there's something that, particularly with architecture, where you're creating places and things for other people, that there's a kind of openness to every new project and every new place, every new community or culture. Um, and so for me, there's, like I've always had, let's say, a, a quite interesting adventure um, and being quite open to, to new experiences. Um, and then on the flip side, I'm sure, as many of you know, there's also this creative moment, which is quite quiet and introverted and sometimes introspective. And actually the balance of those two things, being very outward, but also being very centered uh, in a moment with yourself when you're creating, kind of love that balance. Um, and this, um, this idea of activism um, and kind of putting questions out there. I wrote a letter, this is myself, and... Mary Robinson, um, and uh, a slightly badly timed photograph, but I had written to her. <laughs> she did pose, but the camera didn't go off. Um, so I wrote to her, and I asked her, um, you know, I had this great idea, can we please have school five days a week? All, all year round, I want school. Uh, no, sorry, sorry, hang on, hang on, hang on. It was actually, I want school on the weekends. I want school every weekend, I want it all year round, school on the weekend, but in return I want a five day weekend. And I wrote her this letter and I thought it was like so smart and I had solved all of, all of like, you know, my problems and my friends' problems because we didn't have enough time to hang out. Um, but yeah, in, in the end she invited me to Urs Nuktaran for afternoon tea and, you know, encouraged me to take up uh, the discussion with the Department of Education. <laughs> So, but again, I mean, it's interesting, like such a little lesson for this like seven-year-old me of what you can learn just by putting something out there, no matter how obscure it might seem, you're always going to get a reaction, and often people are very warm um, in, in receiving your ideas. Um, and then moving forward, so I studied architecture, and um, this is my final thesis review uh, when I studied in Switzerland. And I guess... Um, architecture is a huge part of, of who I am and it's, it's very much vocational and it certainly forms my perspective on the world but something that I became very aware of in everywhere that I've worked um, and everywhere I've studied as you can see here this panel of eight men there's one woman on that panel who's translating uh, for a guy who didn't speak English and um, it's been always been very male and so it's, it's never it's, it's been a kind of sort of a challenge but I guess this feeling of maybe not always understanding how I fit into this environment that I was a part of. Um, and I actually read this quote recently from Mary Beard's book, uh, Women and Power. Um, the fact that she is not part of the club of a boy's world, that she isn't one of the lads, has sometimes helped her carve out an independent territory for herself. She's gained pa uh, power and freedom out of exclusion. And I find that quite interesting that sometimes, actually, when you don't feel like you fully belong in a place, you're also given a, a lot of freedom to challenge the preconceptions of that environment. Um, and to offset this very kind of male world that I find myself in, also this incredible kind of gift in the end as a queer woman, um, that I have this incredible, incredible group of amazing women who I would never have met and never have known if it wasn't for this thing that we all share, which is a huge part of our identity. So again, this kind of yin-yang balance um, has been really formative for me. Um, and yeah, that leads to this idea of community. So um, as an architect and as a designer and even in teaching, um, I think this idea of community is really important. And I always try to create kind of positive generative environments through my work. And I think as a background, I spend a lot of time in these kind of amazing buildings that have fostered this idea. Um, so to give you some examples, 
Um, I suppose, yeah, this is, to me, qu quite a clear thing of um, how you might kind of conceptualize that a great building or a great place or a great architecture can become like this coral reef for life with incredible diversity uh, and a place that thrives. Um, so that's really what I kind of strive towards in my work. Um, and these are some of, some of the places and communities that I grew up in. So this was a school I attended, which was this giant old Edwardian house that was converted into like a mad Montessori, Montessori school. These like huge rooms just like filled with kids and every day it was like just the most mad house party. Um, this building on Thomas Street, uh, my grandmother had a lease on this. Uh, it was the biggest kind of retail unit in Thomas Street in the kind of 80s and 90s. And as a toddler, I spent a lot of time in here it's a kind of grocery store and news agents, and it was a women's clothes store, and I used to hang out in there in this little hub, which was like the center of the liberties in Dublin, and just absolutely buzz on the vibe of the city. Um, and this is uh, where I studied in Switzerland, so I did a couple of years in Dublin, and then moved to Switzerland um, to this place that was like Hogwarts for architects. And again, this like super international, like amazing people, incredibly insular, sort of like not really real. Um, but again, this like old converted hospital that they turned into the, uh, the main academy building. And we used to have these like incredible raves in the old morgue in the basement because that was the only place that no one could hear us. <laughs> uh, and here, the tower building. So again, like another like really vibrant community that has given so much, uh, there's so much diversity here. And it really uh, kind of sustains and, and preserves my own um, kind of creative lifestyle. So some of the methodologies in my work as an architect. Um, and I work a lot through models. And generally, concerns range from interior. So this is a model made entirely out of paper, even the people and paintings and everything are there. And thinking about views and light and occupation. Um, and then zooming out again and thinking about this is a model made out of concrete, looking at kind of the volume and massing of, of the kind of form of a building. And right out again, zooming out again to uh, kind of urbanism and how a building and place comes together at a much larger scale. And ultimately, all this model making just allows us to really get inside a project because at the end of the day, when you get on site, you only get to build a building once, so testing all those, all those ideas beforehand is really important. And then on site, it becomes a whole new game, which is very collaborative and very much a conversation between myself and all the guys on site who are you know, really doing all this incredible work. Um, this is a quote from what is essentially my Bible, and it's a book called uh, The Bridge, written by John Hutchinson, um, who is the director of the Douglas Hyde Gallery, or was. And he says, uh, to make well is not necessarily to be skillful, although the two may coincide. Making well is a fading of the self into a more impersonal process, a love and affection for the language and materials in which and from which the object is revealed. Um, and I just, I just love this idea that actually, as, a, as an artist, or as a creative, and as an architect, you're very much kind of finding the integrity of um, and the essence of things. Yeah. Um, and so each project also comes with its own mindset. So I find uh, having a library as kind of touchstones um, is really important uh, in a lot of my work. And uh, this book, Experiencing Architecture, for example, um, looks at how architecture actually affects our daily and day-to-day -day experience. And that informed a little uh, art installation I did, which looked at what would happen if you were in a space with only one wall, so a spherical room, and what happened when you had very little architectural interference, what it might feel like to be in that space. Um, so quite playful. And, and another book in Praise of Shadows, which is a book about Japanese architecture, where there's a lot of love for um, lacquer work and you know, darkness and, and timber and these kind of shadowy things, very much in contrast to Western culture, which is very white and bright and clean. And this book informed this little project, which was um, a room in the center of a house that didn't really have any windows because it was like really locked in the middle of, uh, of the building. And so we decided to wrap uh, the space in this very warm, dark timber cloak that would then facilitate lots of different functions and um, you know, really embrace actually that dark, warm heart of this house. So you can see how these, kind of, these books sort of inform ways of thinking. Um, 
and this is a really important book for me, um, Gentrification of the Mind by Sarah Schulman, which kind of looks at um, capitalism and the erasure of culture and this kind of seeming, seeming sort of battle between the two. She particularly looks at um, the AIDS crisis in New York, but it's, that's a kind of more detailed um, investigation. But that, uh, at the time, I was reading this book around when the repeal movement was really kicking off, and I just felt compelled, you know, against this, like, let's say, uh, capitalist world that we find ourselves in, to make something that was quite personal, and I wanted to make something that reflected what I saw, which was, you know, incredible kind of uh, perseverance and um, amazing dignity and vibrance and integrity of all these people at the front lines of the repeal movement who were really, you know, pushing this thing forward. So I made Uterus Prime, which is a play on Optimus Prime. Um, whoop, you can't go back. <laughs> um, <clears throat> And the result was kind of, like, I just made it as a kind of personal experiment, but the results, uh, a lot of people resonated with that, and I ended up creating a clothing brand, which then became a charity, and over a year and a half, we raised lots of money, and that all went towards the campaign to repeal the eighth. Um, and this little quote from one of my favorite architects, Louis Kahn, I think my training as an architect in terms of how we kind of create things that have meaning for other people, um, I love his quote about, um, as an architect, you are simply the radar of a belief. You are the custodian of a belief that comes to you because as an architect, you are in possession of the powers that, that possess, that sense the psychological entity of something. You are making something that belongs to all of us. And the fact that so many people could, could kind of find power and meaning in uterus prime, I think, to me, that kind of sums up um, how that kind of creativity happens. Um, and then I was really relieved in the end that the National Museum of Ireland requested to have the banner as part of their uh, arts and history collection. Um, and again, you know, you know, throughout the, the campaign was always kind of making these small kind of uh, things. And then, like, I don't know, I was just kind of playing with these motifs. So this is like Batman. I guess I was thinking about how actually so often in our culture, you know, like kids learn to draw phallic symbols, you know, at such a young age, and they're scribbled on homework notebooks, but actually so rarely have kind of comic or, uh, you know, abbreviated symbol of the female figure. So I wanted to kind of play with that idea a bit. Um, and that leads me to kind of contemporary construction and where I position myself as an architect. Um, and I guess what we can all see around us in the city is there's a lot of very necessary renewal going on, but at the same time, um, that can have a detrimental effect on our communities. And I think mean, this is an image from down the road of um, beautiful old brick buildings being demolished to make way for you know these shiny new commercial properties. And seeing all this happen, I just felt compelled to again make a statement about what I what I saw going on around me. So I approached Body and Soul to do an installation built out of brick. I didn't really know what it was going to be, but they gave me this site, which was a small clearing in the woodlands down there. And I wanted to make a piece of architecture outside of the commercial developer world and to see what that would be in a more creative context. Um, so we made was this like tiny little triangular pavilion uh, in this wooden clearing. And yeah, the idea of this thing was to create, to kind of combine the festival habitat with something very architectural. So it's a tent made out of bricks, um, three thin layers of brick tiles. And um, this is what they're made out of, so brick slips that are sliced um, from a brick. And um, these are actually invented to create like fake brick buildings. So you see it happening a lot around Dublin where you have these brick slips and they're stuck on. And actually, this kind of idea of what architecture really is or what that significance of the brick um, might be in our culture, I think gets quite blurred. So it's sort of this motif that says, oh, we're doing something that fits into the city, but really, you know, that's kind of questionable, if you ask me. And particularly things like this, like Giant Tower down in Capital Dock, which is pretty atrocious, if you ask me. And it's just like, we're just going to stick some bricks on, and then, you know, that's Dublin. I'm like, what? <laughs> 
Uh, and then there's this architect who I love, who I discovered when I was in Colombia on another little adventure, who created this amazing brick tower out of solid bricks in like the 1970s and this like earthquake zone, super complicated, but like beautiful. And this place is absolutely thriving. Um, it was all social housing and it's still blooming. Um, an ab absolute hub of, uh, yeah, kind of coral reef for humanity. So um, to build this folly um, and this idea of kind of preserve, we wanted to, I wanted to bring something new um, to kind of reinforce the culture that we have uh, and the skill set that we have in construction in Ireland. Um, so we use this new technology to map out a structure that's a kind of net um, that works on gravity. So if we flip it upside down, it's essentially the same if you hung something upside down, the natural shape that it takes when it's hanging this is a kind of gravitational curve. It's not based on, on geometry. It's purely based on gravity and the natural kind of forces and shapes we find in nature. Um, so it was a really collaborative process. We had like no budget, so I spent quite a lot of time just talking to people and found a lot of passionate people who wanted to get involved. And we created a kind of CNC um, formwork. So like so much of the project was about combining new digital technologies, but also bringing in um, incredibly skilled craftspeople and combining those two to make something new. Um, and so it's built, the folly is built out of these brick slips and each layer is, is laid in a different direction and they create this kind of cross laminated cohesive shell. It's about 7,000 brick slips and the whole thing weighs about five tons. But the more weight you put on it, the stronger it becomes. And it's like really, really thin. It's about the same thickness as a business card. Like you couldn't really make a thinner structure in any other material if you tried. Um, but once I was on site, it was very much about talking to these expert bricklayers who specialize in laying three-dimensional brick walls. And again, working with them on something new and taking their skill and transforming it into something um, quite innovative. And yeah, this is again me and a lot of lads at work. Um, but yeah, it was amazing. And actually, because we had no budget, and because there was no contract, um, and I think the whole project probably cost a little over 65,000 euro, and Body and Soul gave us a budget of 400 euro and a couple of tickets. So everyone who got on board was just passionate. And I found it really interesting that actually you didn't need money to be innovative and you didn't need a contract. You didn't read very much. All you needed to do was to have a conversation and to find other people who were passionate and to work together on it. And one of them sent me this message um, afterwards, uh, someone quite high up in the industry. And I just thought, like, absolutely spot on. Like, it's not just me who feels disillusioned by the construction industry, but actually, here's this guy saying, a job well done. It's been enjoyed by everyone. It's something that we don't get very much anymore in the industry. And that just, like, it's great that you have these moments with people that kind of reinforce um, and the kind of positive effect of, of the work that we're doing. Um, yeah, and I suppose kind of creatively then I was playing with, okay, what, how would we make this thing, this brick tent? And so if any of you are aware of perhaps some of the symbolism of triangle in queer culture and also a symbol of femininity, but again, I wanted it to be very ornamental. So, you know, a structure only needs three legs to stand. So we weren't going to make it any more elaborate than it had to be. And then it became this very, when you see it then, uh, you know, in, from a side perspective, um, it's this very organic thing that sits into the woodlands. And yeah, the craftsmanship, I mean, I couldn't have imagined what the bricklayers could have achieved, but you can see right down to the detail of that equilateral triangle expressed at the brick's apex. Um, and it's a really sustainable form of construction because it's so strong, um, but also bricks are just baked earth, so there's very little in terms of processing um, and manufacturing that actually goes into it. Um, and yet there's this quiet little thing that sits in a, sits in a woodland and then um, has this very strong relationship with landscape. And then once a year it becomes uh, part of this giant party. And I guess the aim of this was to give other people attending the festival uh, a more kind of greater passion about architecture. You know, sometimes you attend a festival and you hear an amazing song or you meet someone new and it like really sticks in your memory. And what I wanted to do was to create a piece of architecture because that's what I'm passionate about that people could encounter and it would excite them and give them a new kind of perspective on what architecture and construction can be in kind of contemporary culture. 
And I love seeing you know, these just little Instagram pictures that I saw, just seeing how people interacted with it, climbing on top of it and interpreting it in their own way. And again, just like gorgeous, like walking past it one night and there's like 30 people in there just having the most amazing, like giant cuddle. It's like so lovely. <laughs> yeah, and then I guess I teach and it's great, you know, my passion, um, it's great to be able to pass that on, but also the people that I teach with and the, and the students that I work with, our passion kind of uh, keeps us all going and we feed each other. So for me, teaching is a really important part of what I do. And these are some first year students who had, we set them a project to design a table. And they weren't allowed to use any glue or screws. They had to make a table out of a certain amount of timber and understand the material and all its constraints and how it went together and you know, they work similar to how, to how I would work, which is through different models, and the, the kind of different ideas they came up with were amazing, given the very limited uh, means that we had given them. Um, but for me, what was really important then was giving them a chance to actually test their ideas in the real world. So we went to a festival last summer, and drop everything down on, um, out on in a year, last May, and I think I suppose for anyone who's creative, it's often, we can often be quite afraid to put our ideas out there. And um, we we're kind of sometimes striving for perfect perfection and that can hold us back. But for me, you know, taking these students out to, you know, spend a day working really hard, do something great, you know, create a, a dining experience for like 100 people and then just party like maniacs all night afterwards. And um, hopefully they've gotten a lot out of that as well. And I think just encouraging people to get out there and, and, uh, and share their work is just really important. So I'm gonna close with this um, about passion. Um, and this video really stuck with me. It's a video clip from uh, David Attenborough. And it's a video um, that he released um, quite recently, but it's archive footage from 1950. And he had spent a night on a beach watching sea turtles lay their eggs. And in the morning, himself and his mates went <coughs> and pillaged the uh, nest and made scrambled turtles' eggs for breakfast. And you're just looking at this going, wow, like that's insane. Um, but I think the journey you know, that he has gone on um, and the lesson that I would take from him would be, you know, don't eat your passion for breakfast. <laughs> <laughs> but uh, you know, invest in it, be curious, um, you know, create, transform and innovate. Thank you.